There we go. Is that working? Yes. Um, so we just had a fantastic panel, which gave us a much larger, broader overview of the challenges pre and post Sandy. Um, I'm delighted to uh, moderate here with, in some ways, really the people who are part of the where the rubber meets the road, the real implementers, the micromanagers that are dealing with the problems in particular neighborhoods, particular um, communities. And think about the challenges of maintaining that capacity in the, the world of lack of financing, political discussions that we've seen that I spoke about earlier today. And so I think this panel is really uh, is, a, is a group that can and must inform implementation of how do you sustain, how do you end up delivering for the community on, on your vision? Because this is where, at a local level, it really, really happens. And, Roland put the question, but I'll repeat it, which is, there was a world that you were all working in very effectively pre-Sandy, um, and now we face the post-Sandy world. How has that changed your strategies for implementation? What's been effective, what's been ineffective? Um, and how does, how does this then end up transforming your vision for the group that you're working with? And how successful has that vision been integrated into the larger political or community focus that we heard from the first panel. And if we could, we'll just march right down the table. And if everybody would take, you know, five to seven minutes to um, answer and speak to that question, then we can open up for a lively discussion. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Roland and Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance for inviting us to speak. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the Greater Rockaway vision. And this was a community-led vision that we hosted in 2010-11 in partnership with Trust for Public Land uh, and Jonathan Rosen Company. And one of the things that, um, you know, looking back on that, it was, it was actually a great opportunity to really gather the community before we were hit by a storm, uh, the magnitude of Storm Sandy, but also to organize different uh, community organizations and individuals in how do we strengthen our community uh, from the ground up. And so uh, I think one of the, the major things that came out of that was really the struggles and the issues that we had in the Rockaways with the various communities and the disconnect between them. One of the things that the community identified though as their strength was the boardwalk. And the boardwalk specifically as the spine for the community, the one thing that brought people together, the one thing that brought them to the water and to programs and services. And at the time it was still broken really in many ways, but after the storm it was even more so and now has been uh, completely uh, destroyed in, in most parts of the Rockaways. So this is a huge issue and I think it's one of the bigger uh, uh, things that, tasks that we have now to try and organize the boardwalk and the structure of that, working with the various agencies to make that happen. But I also think that um, what's, what's a huge struggle is that many of the government agencies have already taken the lead on what is going to be happening. Um, they've gone back to the community and tried to get ideas, but I think the bottom line is they're going to take care of that for us in some ways, maybe not for the better, but I think uh, they're going to try their best to, to push forward on that. And I think, um, you know, the other thing that we've been pushing for was to find other connections, though, that can also connect the community. Twelve of those priorities that were outlined in this plan were actually focused more so on transportation, both water-based transportation through ferry service, through man-powered boating, and also through biking and pedestrian walkways. Since the storm, the majority of the residents who are walking in the Rockaways are doing so on an underpass of the A-Train subway, which runs from Beach 116th Street all the way to Mott Avenue. That's a long stretch, it's about five miles of the peninsula, and offers a tremendous opportunity for the fact that people are using it already. How do we make it happen that people can actually safely get there where either we limit car traffic or establish various lanes? So that's one of the major initiatives we're doing. I think, again, it's a more grassroots issue of it's already there, the structure already exists, let's use it. Um, and I would say that post Sandy, you know, there's a lot of efforts now for organizing protective buffers. How do we do that? And prior to Storm Sandy, I don't think that there was enough discussion about that. Um, I think that one of the things that came out of um, Storm Sandy was that we had a phenomenal uh, number of volunteers and people who came out of the woodwork who said, we want to help, we want to be involved. And I would say uh, the biggest struggle we have right now is that um, 
trying to find ways of community really ha having a role in some of the rebuilding efforts. I would say that the protective buffer that we're talking about um, and has been repeated uh, was the primary secondary dune structure. And so we've worked very closely with city parks, many other agencies to try and make that happen. Um, it's been a really tough process because there's so many agencies involved. And so um, that is one of the mandates that we're moving forward on that was not really highlighted in this plan prior to Sandy. I don't think it was really as strong and as clear that we needed that. Um, and then the third thing that I want to highlight as well that came out of this, this uh, was really the idea of education. And I think that one of the things that I'm, I've been very, very focused on in the past 10 years has been initiating and encouraging young people uh, and the Department of Education to play a key role in educating future leaders in STEM-related careers, but also in being involved in some of these efforts. And so I think there cannot be enough uh, to be said to truly trying to push on that. And I would la like to add one last comment, which is I'd like to thank um, Arjun Bromstomp uh, from the Dutch Consulate's office, as well as Ron Schiffman, who invited me recently to come to the Netherlands um, and see what the, what the Dutch had done. And I would say that one of the things that was really uh, admirable about the work that the Dutch had done was that almost every component of the work that they've done has an educational component to it. They have interpretive... Uh, resources where people can come and learn about what was built and I would say again in much of the work that we did with the community it was really focused on how do we get the community involved how do we get uh, educational resources and use the environment as an educational resource for more programs and I would say I could speak for most nonprofits in the Rockaways to say we need more funding specifically on the ground for getting people and kids and uh, community members involved in these very grassroots efforts for planning the future of the Rockaways and the rest of New York City's shoreline. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to take one second to sort of encapsulate what I think you said, which was the salient point was community disconnect from the rush of government to build and the lack of integration between government's movement and the community-based planning. We'll come back to that. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Joe Delafav, Executive Director at Ironbound Community Corporation in Newark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I just want to take a quick note to say it's also a, a pleasure to be here with an old friend, Ron Hine, of Hoboken on the panel. Uh, many years ago, when I was a city councilman in Hoboken, we shared some waterfront victories together. Really proud of uh, the work that Ron and his group have done uh, in town. Um, I want to give you some background information quickly on the organization and on the community before we talk about the riverfront and Sandy. Um, our agency is 45 years old this year. Uh, I've been serving as executive director for 23 years, and it's primarily a services organization. We provide educational and uh, programs and social services for 1,000 people every day. Uh, in addition to that, we do environmental justice, community building, planning, development, and organizing initiatives. Um, the community itself, uh, by way of its industrial legacy, is plagued with environmental problems. Uh, just to give you some quick examples, we house the state's largest garbage incinerator, burning a million tons of garbage each year, 50% of which comes from New York City. Um, our high school stadium has been closed for 27 years due to PCB contamination. The world's greatest concentration of dioxin sits on a Passaic River at a Superfund site. Uh, these are just some examples. And what this has meant to us very simply is, is that we learned early on the connection between the environment, public health, and quality of life. So more than 30 years ago, we started building an environmental justice movement within the community. And through that, we not only meant to clean up toxic sites, reduce air pollution, but also fight new facilities that would bring greater pollution into the neighborhood. But in the 90s, we turned a corner a bit, and we realized that you can't always fight these things. At some point, the community has to take control over its own destiny. So it was in the 90s that we began community planning. And 15 years ago, we produced the city's first community-based master plan. And I must just simply note that at that time, Newark, the state's largest city, had no planning department. Uh, so the community was essentially was doing the planning for its own purpose and also for obviously improving its own neighborhood. Um, that community master plan has two noteworthy items to it, I think, that are pertinent to today's discussion. 
Uh, the community is bordered on the north by the Passaic River, which is arguably the, uh, the country's most um, uh, polluted water body, uh, strewn with dioxin and other contaminants. Uh, along that, you have about a quarter of a mile of heavy industry, bordered then by a low-income housing project populated primarily by African Americans, and then about a mile, mile and a quarter of uh, dilapidated riverfront um, brownfields property in which we envisioned as the Green Mile, the waterfront park of the future, 15 years ago. Um, I would just simply jump to the last two years when we've had two seminal events. One is that in the last two years, in partnership with the city and the county, we celebrated the opening of 15 acres of riverfront park along this riverfront. Secondly, you had Sandy. And Sandy, in fact, impacted the Ironbound mostly through that industrial section that I identified, taking with it not only the toxic dioxin-strewn waters through heavy industry into the residents. That neighborhood in our master plan, we had zoned for no more residential housing for industry only. We were working with the city administration at the time, which basically disregarded all of that. I must say, though, that in the last eight years, we've not only accomplished the Riverfront Park, but this master plan has largely been incorporated into the city's master plan. So under the Cory Booker administration and the county administration of DiVincenzo, we've been able to make tremendous strides. How do you do that? Nothing was easy. This has been a 25-year struggle. It takes community organizing, demonstrations, pressuring, and eventually partnership building. Uh, prayer vigils on the waterfront, demonstrations, children carrying placards to City Hall until eventually we got the attention and together with the City of Newark, with the county, with the Trust for Public Land, we built 15 acres of Riverfront Park. I think uh, when you get those accomplishments, those successes, what also comes with it is empowerment of the community itself, realizing that you can accomplish on almost anything. The Sandy effort, um, two things that we learned that uh, came out of Sandy. Number one is, is that it called upon us to combine both our services and our advocacy. So since then, we have physically rehabilitated numerous homes, provided financial services. We've been case managing 200 uh, households most recently, probably 800 in the course of the last year and a half. Uh, in addition to that, I think we're close to realizing another planning uh, accomplishment. While we wanted very little uh, residential development to occur in that industrial section, we are now working with the state of New Jersey on the Blue Acres program to buy out the residences in that section, in that industrial area that were impacted by Sandy to move them out of that toxic mix of heavy industry, residences, and a great deal of pollution from the neighboring incinerator. Uh, by the way, we raised the first $3 million for the Riverfront Park, a million of which came from a environmental justice lawsuit of the incinerator over the Clean Air Act. Um, just quickly, some lessons learned uh, on all of this for us. Uh, number one, the power of the community and the, the vision of the community to know itself best. And, you know, we plead with the authorities, work with the community, and the community must stay vigilant in forcing that to happen. So we've been able to get that partnership. Second, urban waterfronts need attention uh, in this climate change world. And not just in terms of we saw that there was less uh, deluge coming through the park than through the hard surfaces of the industrial sector, uh, but the softening, so the softening of the riverfront, uh, the mitigation and resiliency efforts that need to be made in urban communities is critical. And it's also critical because we're talking about equity and justice. The people in Newark who are impacted, including the drowning of a worker on the riverfront, are the most vulnerable. We're talking about low-income families, we're talking about undocumented immigrants, people of little means. So when they were impacted, it wasn't just the loss of a home, the loss of a job, but also the belief that no access to resources until we got to the table and brought them there. So we need to pay attention to the most vulnerable in our urban communities in the course of looking at climate change. And it's not just floods, it's also heat waves. Newark is a uh, heat island. We need to t pay attention to the impact of all of this in all regards on urban centers, on urban waterfronts, and on the most vulnerable people in our society, which we consider to focus on equity and justice issues. Great, thank you. Um, so I don't talk too much. Why don't we just give everybody enough time? Please um, bear in mind, we do have, we're gonna need time for questions, so, but let's just keep going. Okay, great. 
Is this on? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Chauncey Young, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Harlem River Working Group. Uh, just a little background on it. Harlem River, River, River Working Group is a project that grew out of uh, planning meetings between park advocates, environmental organizations, community organizations, and the Bronx Borough President's uh, Office in late 2008. Um, over time, the working group has grown to include over uh, 50 organizations and has secured support of NOAA and National Park Service and was one of the first seven rivers, the Harlem River, to be uh, designated part of the Urban Waters uh, Federal Partnership. So the Harlem River Working Group is focused on improving access to and along the Harlem River, an area stretching 9.3 miles um, from Randall's Island to the Hudson River uh, in New York City. And our goal is reclaiming the Harlem River, reconnecting the waterfront with the people, recreating the water's edge, reinvigorating on-water recreational commercial activities. There's currently very limited public uh, accessible open space along the Bronx waterfront. Uh, no continuous system of bicycle pedestrian pathways connecting the waterfront to upland destinations um, and extremely limited access for uh, human powered boats. Um, you know, th there's been visions and plans for over 25 years for the Harlem River waterfront. Uh, and there's uh, been so many different groups that have been a part of this. What we've done is we sort of compiled together all the different uh, vision plans, uh, worked with uh, all the different community boards within the five community boards, uh, all the different organizations to try to create a plan, a master document, Our River, Our Future, um, because historically, uh, the Harlem River has been really the center of uh, New York City's on water recreation. Um, you know, and, and waterfront was parkland that was used by residents, um, and the High Bridge was one of the, you know, most visited sites uh, throughout New York City. Um, you know, over a hundred years ago, the river was used for boating, regattas, and and ferry transit, um, and there were so many boathouses, docks, and clubs along the edge of the rivers. Um, but when you look at the Harlem River waterfront today, uh, what you see is you see that. The upland communities, because most of the communities on the Harlem River are up on hills, um, have been separated from the waterfront um, by a transportation corridor that's used by almost a million people each day, um, for which they pay a heavy cost in terms of uh, health and uh, access uh, to and use of their waterfront. And the uh, rail and, uh, and highway system has created an envelope of blight uh, for which the you know world perceives our neighborhoods and through which residents need to pass if they want to get to the waterfront. So <clears throat> one of the visions for our, uh, our waterfront was to really try to make those connections. There's at this point uh, only two sections where you can get down past uh, that transportation corridor uh, within a five mile stretch of, of the waterfront. I mean, you're really separated uh, from that. You have Roberts Clemente State Park in the north, then you, you're going down to where the high bridge is, uh, and, and there you have an access point, which is a depot place, which is also an on-ramp uh, for the Deegan Expressway. So that's our link to the Greenway at, in the midpoint. Uh, once you go further south, you have uh, the Oak Point Line, uh, which is a 1.9 uh, mile rail line that was uh, the US's most expensive rail line because it was built in the Harlem River uh, on pylons. So even as we've developed waterfront parks, the first one in 2009, um, uh, Mill, uh, Mill Pond Park, uh, which was designed originally to have water and boat access, uh, the Oak Point uh, Link at high tide, there's only a few inches between the rail line and, and the Harlem River. So while you can get out on low tide on a boat, you can't safely get back on high tide, so we've been uh, forced to not allow, uh, New York City Parks have decided that that's not a safe space for boaters to use. Uh, there's currently one uh, place uh, along the entire Bronx length of the Harlem River waterfront where you can get out on the water legally, and that's in um, Roberts Clemente State Park. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that's utilized by one of our uh, partners, uh, Harlem River Community Rowing, but for community members generally using um, boat transportation, uh, recreational boats, it's impossible right now. So that's one of the things that we're trying to change. Um, we have had some victories um, in, 
that's my time for myself. Um, well I'll be done. very quick. Like, well done. Um, Rebuild by Design uh, recently in, in, in Hunts Point has been focusing on uh, the issue of how much uh, we can have uh, impact on our waterfront. Folks know that Hunts Point is our, our regional uh, food infrastructure and with Sandy there was a great possibility of damage uh, to that, but the question that we have and we've posed for many years is what's the possibility when you create a productive buffer or seawall for that, that we can also develop green a greenway along that space. Uh, the uh, Roberts Clemente State Park has a bulkhead uh, and that bulkhead uh, was severely damaged on the range of about $40 million uh, worth of damage to that bulkhead, uh, which also has one, a large residential uh, housing complex connected to it. And uh, the way that we can now hope to re-envision that edge uh, and make it a soft edge uh, that could hopefully be better uh, able to, to sustain uh, storm damage in the future. Okay, I appreciate the discipline with the self-alarm there. Um, <laughs> so respecting all the other um, panelists, let's move on and then we'll go to questions. Uh, so I am representing Green Shores NYC, and we advocate for the eight miles of East River waterfront in Queens. So our southern border is Newtown Creek, and our northern border is uh, Bowery Bay. Uh, we also partnered with Trust for Public Land to implement a vision plan for Western Queens, and to echo some of the comments that Jean and Joe made, part of the goal of our vision was to really empower and engage community members to take a vested interest in their waterfront. So those of you that know Queens or live there, you know that people identify more with their neighborhood or the sub-neighborhood they live in. So it takes a little bit of finessing to actually engage people to think in a broader term outside their uh, small geographic scope. So one of the goals that we had, which was accomplished successfully, was to have neighborhood residents think of their waterfront as a continuous waterfront, even though in some ways there are blockages to the continuity. Um, in a way, we have two waterfronts. So in the neighborhood Hunter's Point, which is on the southern end of our scope, on Newtown Creek and the East River, um, you have newer developments coming in where in the past uh, there was more industry. And you have people that now live in high rises that abut the East River. And one of the things about that that's good is as things become built, now after Sandy there are new um, code rules and laws that need to be implemented in your construction plans and your architecture. But then you have the old waterfront, which is north, where in places like the Astoria houses, where the infrastructure is poorly maintained, and there doesn't really seem to be a plan to improve that. Um, so one of the things that we noticed from our vision plan was that people want more access to the waterfront in regards to upland transportation to and from the waterfront because it's not that good. Um, only two of our parks have direct, almost direct subway transit and buses that l run along the waterfront are erratic at best. Um, the other thing that's come into play post Sandy is the fact that how do you define the waterfront? It used to be directly on it or in front of it, and now it seems to be, from Sandy we've learned, it's actually five blocks inland. So how do you live in a place that you used to assume you were secure and safe from flooding, and thankfully the city modified their flood zones, where most of our communities now are in floodplain, how do you manage that and how do you move forward and how do you, with clear conscience, build very dense um, developments in a space that ultimately will experience additional flooding. But the silver lining is all of our vision plans actually bring to light to our residents, our neighbors and our friends, and even elected officials, the fact that people care, they have a vested interest in their waterfront, they want not only amenities, but they want safety, um, environmental integrity, and transit with ferries. Um, 
really just highlighting the fact that we live on islands and especially in our communities we've been cut off and kind of disengaged from that for a long time and our vision plan took that another step and a negative thing that happened from Sandy though it will be positive ultimately hopefully is the fact that we can't control the water so you'd get the good and the bad when you're in a waterfront community thank you Uh, I, I've been provided this wonderful uh, visual right over here. That's the Hoboken waterfront uh, behind <laughs> you. But <laughs> uh, by the 1980s, uh, the waterfront industries that had once uh, flourished on the Hudson River waterfront, uh, uh, from uh, Jersey City all the way up to the, the GW Bridge, had virtually disappeared. Uh, and there were hundreds of acres of abandoned, derelict waterfront uh, ripe for redevelopment. So uh, in 1990, uh, the city of Hoboken and, and the Port Authority uh, proposed a uh, massive development on Hoboken South waterfront. Uh, it included a 33-story uh, uh, office complex on Pier A, uh, which is now a public park and uh, half a million uh, square feet of residential development on Pier C, which is also a park now. Um, we uh, defeated this proposal in a public referendum in 1990. Uh, and after that, we formed uh, the Fund for a Better Waterfront. And uh, our first task was uh, to create a vision for what could happen on Hoboken's waterfront. Uh, because uh, our municipality had failed to do so. Uh, now, I, I had no idea uh, what constituted uh, a good plan for our waterfront, uh, but we uh, had the good fortune of hiring uh, a, a planner and architect, uh, Craig Whitaker, who had a, an acute understanding of uh, urban design. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, we came up with a plan the centerpiece of which was a continuous public uh, waterfront park from one end of town to the other. Uh, and it, an extended uh, public street grid uh, provided Hoboken sized blocks for new development. And the last street at the waterfront, uh, Sonata Drive, became our line in the sand. Uh, we said the, the new development is to take place on those upland blocks. And when you cross Sonata Drive, you enter the public realm. You enter a public waterfront park. Um, so in short order, we had uh, our plan, a two-dimensional plan. Uh, we uh, wrote two books. Uh, we built a 12-foot by 4-foot architectural model. There it is. And uh, so anyway, the, here's the one book, Reclaiming the Waterfront, uh, a planning guide for waterfront municipalities. Uh, we sent this to all the elected officials up and down the uh, Jersey waterfront, and uh, uh, also to all the uh, uh, planning board members. And I figured, OK, that takes care of that. Uh, they'll read our book. They'll know uh, what to do. And then we're going to end up with this stellar waterfront from along the, the so-called New Jersey Go Gold Coast, from Jersey City up to the GW Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, in the years ahead, we watched the development of, the, uh, of this waterfront unfold. And uh, typically, developers uh, drove the process. Uh, we saw uh, one private enclave after another being erected uh, with guardhouses, gates, fences. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the private development typically abutted the state mandated public walkway uh, and it made it difficult uh, to access. There was not a clear separation between the public and private. So people, when people go out there, yeah, they know it's a public walk, but they don't, it doesn't feel like a truly public space, like a public park, which is what we were aiming to, to achieve. Um, so the exception was Hoboken. Uh, in 1992, we won a second uh, referendum, and uh, in 1995, the city of Hoboken adopted a redevelopment plan that embraced nearly all of the uh, principles that we have been advocating. 
Uh, it's now uh, been built. It serves as a model for other communities to emulate. Uh, we have a, a beautifully landscaped uh, waterfront park at the South Waterfront, and uh, it's received numerous awards. Uh, now, the state of New Jersey has uh, granted a tremendous uh, planning powers to municipalities. Uh, they can uh, adopt official maps, uh, thereby uh, uh, mapping the public streets. Uh, they can create redevelopment zones. They can de designate what's going to be uh, public space, what's going to be privately developed. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, there was this grand opportunity for all the municipalities up and down, uh, you know, Jersey City, Hoboken, uh, Weehawken, West New York, uh, you know, all the way up to uh, Edgewater, New Jersey. Uh, the one community that took advantage was Hoboken. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this was due largely to the fact that, that we had initiated uh, this plan. We have advocated for, for, for good planning and urban design and a public waterfront park. And uh, so Ho Hoboken t was able to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity that was presented. Uh, but our work is not over. Uh, right now we're trying to fix a number of problems at the central waterfront. We're trying to establish a, uh, a working relationship with the city of Hoboken. Uh, even with a new crop of political leaders, uh, I have to say it's not as easy as we had hoped, but we were persisting and, and ho ho hopefully we're going to end up with a successful result. Uh, now, I just want to mention three, th three things uh, in, in terms of the resiliency issue. Of course, we had no idea that Sandy was coming, and uh, I, I am... I, I had no memory of any surge before on, you know, c coming into Hoboken. So, so when we were doing the planning process, we, we really weren't thinking about those issues. But it turns out uh, there were three things that worked to our advantage on the waterfront. Uh, one was creating the waterfront park. The further back you put the uh, private development, the safer it is. So, so you have a buffer in the public park, the public street at the waterfront. Uh, the, f the further back uh, the buildings are set, the, the, the more protection they're provided. Uh, this, the second, uh, second thing is the elevation. It's, I, mean, I guess I'm stating the obvious. Uh, the fact is that at both at the, at the north and the south waterfront, uh, it was built to a high enough elevation so that when the surge, the sandy surge came, uh, the damage to buildings at the waterfront was minimal. Uh, the, ma the main problem in Hoboken was it breached at the south and north end of town and filled up the town with uh, like a bathtub and 75% of the town was flooded. Tremendous damage out farthest away from the, the, the river on the west side of town. And then the third thing, and I think and th this is really a wonderful feature about the uh, south waterfront, we had some uh, landscape architects, Henry Arnold uh, deserves special credit here for uh, uh, put, putting three feet of, uh, it's a soilless mix, it's an expanded shale, very lightweight medium for the uh, 200 trees for this waterfront park uh, to grow in. They quickly established themselves and when the surge uh, came over the uh, Pire Park and the promenade, uh, nearly all of them survived. Uh, but we had some other examples, Pier C Park, uh, which was not part of the Henry Arnold uh, uh, landscape design. Uh, Maxwell Place Park, tremendous damage. Pier C Park, uh, the, it took nine months to make all the repairs. So, so that's a cautionary tale as to how not to design a waterfront park. Thanks. Moving right along. Sure. So, uh, so I don't have a plan. I come from a global strategy group. We are uh, a political consulting firm. We help candidates run for office and help uh, elected officials stay in office. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it a little from the from the political perspective, and I want to come back to something that Joseph mentioned, which is the power of communities. And you know, I think um, often communities underestimate their power and the power they have uh, when it relates to how elected officials get involved in issues. 
And ultimately, to be successful in a lot of ways with these plans, it involves having champions. Who is going to carry it forward? Who is going to make sure that the funding actually happens? And who is going to, when there's the big government bureaucracy at play, um, and you know, as we were talking before with resiliency issues, that there may be a larger government plan at, at stake here, um, making sure that your vision is, is powered through and into that, that broader vision. Um, so from that perspective, you know, we th I think about it from uh, message, messengers, tone, and how you create opportunity. Um, in, in terms of message, uh, you know, there are obviously, we do a lot of polling for elected officials. It's a lot about what, what is the message? What is resonating? What do voters care about? Um, you know, and, and obviously that changes over time, but you know, resiliency obviously has a, a critical um, power right now, but it is not the only one. And I think while, you know, for uh, Staten Island and Rockways in particular, it's something that carries a, a lot of residents right now, um, inequity, economic development, job creation, opportunity, access. Uh, Roland and I have talked a lot about um, how you frame waterfront and, and um, how you frame focus on waterfront as an issue of equity and access. And it's something that I think resonates uh, very strongly with elected officials. Um, the messenger matters a lot here. And you know the, the, the issues that tend to break through, and a lot of this is about um, kind of issue competition, right? What, what issue is going to actually get championed or not? The messenger matters. And you know, the, the, the nonprofits and the advocacy organizations and the projects that seem to do it really well are the ones that create sort of the strangest of bedfellows. When you put that coalition together that is surprising, that is um, ideologically diverse, it creates um, something that, that, that really rises above. Um, you know, from a, from a tone per point of view, I think what's important is both Always remember that communities have both the carrot and the stick. Um, on, on the carrot side is the opportunity to create, um, to create victories, to create wins, to create opportunities for elected officials to be leaders in their community um, and be able to create those, those, those wonderful visuals uh, that every elected official is, is, is looking for. At the same time, there is, there is the stick. Uh, you know, the, the squeaky wheel does work. And I think, you know, Ron, is the work you did in, in Hoboken was never stopping. It was, it was always fighting and always pushing forward and not accepting and pushing things to public referendum when you needed to and winning those public referendums that ultimately resulted in, in, in the success you saw. Um, and it, the, the last thing I would just say is um, in a lot of ways, while it's there's a lot going on and there are a lot of different um, issues that are, sorry, a lot of different issues competing for attention. You know, the, the media landscape today provides also a lot of opportunity for, for advocacy organizations and for, for pushing uh, plans forward. Um, you know, from the level of community papers to the political blogs, you know, every elected official in their staff wakes up every morning and looks at city and state and um, you know, the Cranes Daily and creating visual opportunities and creating um, uh, events that force uh, reporters to cover them, whether it's at that community paper level, the political level or tabloid level, uh, is, is, is really a critical stake right now and something that can really be done in a way that um, I think that wasn't as easy to do even 10 years ago when you didn't have the digital media um, at the level and robustness you have you have today. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of a, a political Great. look at Thanks. that. Thanks. Um, everybody should bear in mind, please speak into the microphone. So wait, project to the back of the room. It's like theater class. Good idea. Is that good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. not. That's, that's, that's not so good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to recognize a, you know, a couple of common themes and also some common struggles because as tremendous as the victories that all of you have talked about are, you know, and, and everybody knows here, 
you're still struggling. You know, it's um, that as you know, every inch of access to the waterfront in economically challenged communities is a huge, huge victory. But it also just shows us how far we have to go. So, I mean, one. So I have a, a statement and then a question. The the observation is you and everybody else that you know that could have been at this table and isn't because there are so many scores and hundreds of communities working to get access to their waterfront feel must feel tremendously vindicated on the one hand because a lot of the post sandy mainstreaming of ideas about ecologically smart design about you know strategic use of hard and soft edges on the waterfront about making the waterfront a part of people's day-to-day -day experience so that they not only experience it recreationally, but educationally. And they and through education and engagement, people become stewards, they become champions, they, you know, they become engaged on the larger issues of climate change in a way that is eventually going to drive our elected leaders to do the right thing, but it's taking a while. So you must on the one hand feel really vindicated and on the other hand kind of the chopped liver effect. Like we've been saying this for years and all of a sudden it's new because different people are saying it, so what do we chop liver? Um, so that, you know, that's the price of victory. The question I have is for communities that are not wealthy, there's a, there's a double-edged nature to opening up access to the waterfront and you're offered in many cases, you know, there, there's a paradigm that is usually implicit, sometimes made explicit, that you know, opening up the waterfront is tremendously expensive. The nature of the infrastructure is that it's costly to build, it's costly to maintain, and whenever a community group steps out with a vision for the waterfront, it isn't only how are you going to pay the capital costs, it's where's the revenue stream that sustains this. And it's assumed that you can't have a waterfront open to people unless you find a way to monetize it. And the framing of how you monetize it is narrow and fiscal. It's, it's usually done through real estate value, right? And it either, you know, that that real estate value is either captured directly through some kind of public-private partnership or indirectly just through general, you know, rateables and, ta you know, increased tax collection. So that's, gentrification is one path. And the other path is to monetize the value of the burdensome infrastructure that low-income waterfronts are still expected to sustain. So need to expand our sewage treatment capacity. Ooh, wow, we did this big site selection study and you're it, okay? Uh, you know, we need to add more electric power generation capacity. It's, you know, we need to expand highway access, et cetera, et cetera. So communities have two, two really unappealing ways to monetize the value of their waterfronts. I wonder if Sandy has opened up that frame and made it possible for you to talk about the regional level value that your waterfronts create, the way that new waterfront parks help to buffer against Sandy, okay? the way that waterfront parks can, you know, can begin to mitigate the heat island effect and so on and so forth. So is, you know, maybe in the short term sense, how have you identified and pursued opportunities that federal, federal funding opens up? And in the longer term sense, how is it possible to, you know, for communities to claim the value of the ecosystem and resiliency services that you provide? So I'd take anybody's answer to that. Yeah, I think that was a great, great um, summary and really posed the question that I'll rephrase very simply was, did Sandy make your job easier and practical examples of how it did and the challenges going forward? And our contestants now have less time to answer that question, so please be brief. I, I do, but I'll wait. Go ahead. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, in the Rockaways, we, we nailed this plan prior to the storm, right? We gave the city really a blueprint for some of the things the community wanted, and now they have their marching orders. So I think we're in a really key time right now where, where this moment is gonna pass, 
And if we don't take advantage of really moving on this to actually implement something, even if it's the small stuff, the community's gonna have no clear message that anybody's listening to them, that for all the planning and all the work that's been done in the past year and a half, there's been countless plans that were on the table before, there's countless plans on the table now, something has to happen. I mean, something clearly has to be implemented, and even the small stuff, just something to get the wheels rolling, because I think if, if for nothing else, we would have learned nothing from Storm Sandy if we don't actually have something clear that, and tangible that people can look at and say, that is gonna help my community, and that's gonna help connect our, uh, our, our community to the waterfront. Um, may I? That's okay. <laughs> Um, just two quick comments. Um, uh, the first is I think, you know, Sandy did make the job harder, so to speak. I think we thought we knew something about planning when we were trying to build a sustainable, just, and equitable community through planning as well as other measures. Um, but now you're talking about resiliency, mitigation, and other things that, you know, many other aspects to keep in mind as we, as we do our planning work, uh, building lead neighborhoods, sustainable neighborhoods as part of all of this. Uh, to contribute to a, a healthy community and to manage coming climate control. And, and of course, none of us were prepared, so building emergency management plans and things of that sort in partnership with the city, the neighborhood, the community, and all our partners. Uh, the second thing I want to say real quickly is I, I really appreciate your question about uh, you build a riverfront and it enhances value, and how does the neighborhood claim that value, so to speak? And um, I mean, I think I have I, I have a little bit of a unique perspective maybe on this because I grew up in Hoboken and I've seen the changes in Hoboken. And if you take a snapshot of Hoboken in 1980 and take a snapshot today, it's an incredible, you see incredible progress. In the course of that, you had tremendous displacement. So you had forced gentrification where literally dozens of people um, uh, lost their lives through Austin for profit fires. Um, we in Ironbound are trying to build a community that anyone will want to live in and the people who are there can re choose to remain there. And I think you do that by building strong stakeholders in your neighborhood through community organizing and engagement, people taking control of every block, and, um, and essentially working against market forces in as many ways as possible by doing land trusts for affordable housing, uh, working with your uh, working with your municipality to force the issues of equity and justice up front, uh, working with developers. There are many enlightened developers out there who will work with communities and 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 provide the benefits that communities need, along with the investment and the returns that they're looking for. So I think looking at all of those types of things as part of the way a, a, a community moves on is critical to everyone receiving the benefits of progress. I also wanted to speak uh, specifically in the Highbridge uh, and uh, South Bronx area. I think there's very specific concerns around around this post uh, Sandy. Um, the lower uh, concourse redevelopment plan, which uh, you know stipulates a greenway, uh, which we're excited about as part of any development that happens south of 149th Street, um, is is wonderful. Uh, but also connected with that is most of that development along there will probably be high rise residential commercial development with that greenway component to it. So the gentrification is is a real concern for community members living in that area and just being priced out uh, in the future. Um, an issue post Sandy that is all that area um, is, you know, within uh, the flood zone. I mean, all those properties are, you know, five to eight, 10 feet uh, above above uh, the water level right now. So, you know, how, how those are redesigned and, and how that's rethought, uh, perhaps the residential should be pushed back further and create more of a green space uh, that would create uh, additional safety. Another issue that we have where I don't think uh, we've, we've you know, thought very well, rather controversial space in, in, in the South Bronx right now is uh, the uh, uh, Fresh Direct proposal where they're, you know, planning on uh, moving the Fresh Direct uh, uh, facilities right on the uh, Harlem River um, waterfront and I think that's something where there hasn't been although we've been pushing to have a green, uh, continuous greenway there is not at this point uh, any openness to uh, looking at how we can have both commercial use of that 
hundred uh, acres of state-owned property uh, to have a greenway included with that and and waterfront access included with that that could create uh, a, a barrier uh, for uh, storm type situations. Uh, so to talk specifically about your question about the value of ecosystems, um, Sandy and Western Queens didn't really change that. Um, we have a problem where there are swaths of parcels of waterfront that will be cut off until they are developed. So that's the trade-off, is that we're not gonna have access to them until they're developed, until a development breaks ground, and eventually, in however many years, it will be built. Um, answering the question about underserved populations, often, if you don't have uh, amenities, these new developments come in and they bring them. So it's this dynamic where you want services, you don't necessarily want more development, but the services are vital to your livelihood and your life. So you say, okay, let's take the development and then we get you know, this parcel of land. So it's a little bit of an uncomfortable situation for residents and also for us. We're not anti-development, we're just pro-responsible development and uh, pro-waterfront um, equality. So it's this mix of accepting and you know, wanting the space, but then having to wait for it until people with money that we don't have can open it up to us. So this is an ongoing problem. I know it's not unique to Western Queens. I know it's city and region wide, but that's something that hasn't changed at all, which is a little disappointing. So do our two commentators want to um, add or respond to those four, um, four examples? Did Sandy help or not help? Because I thought you, it was a you great- You're gonna let Ron talk? Oh, sorry. No, I'm not actually. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just want to give uh, one example of uh, where uh, Sandy may have worked to our advantage. Uh, uh, when we started out, we uh, were adamantly opposed to uh, private development on any of the piers. Uh, and this was on the base, basis of uh, the advice that we were given by our planner that once you allow that to happen, that part of the waterfront will become private, not public. Uh, so we had a whole series of battles to uh, prevent that from happening in Hoboken, and so far we've been successful. Uh, now later we learned that there's actually a legal doctrine, the public trust doctrine, that supports that whole idea. I mean, you're, you're out over the Hudson River, which technically is, is public land, and uh, what, what, why would you allow uh, that to be uh, privatized in that way. Uh, so, Sa Sandy, and, and, a, and we're fighting a battle right now at the, at the north end of Hoboken. Uh, it's in litigation. Uh, we're, we're, we have our lawyers working on it. The city is also on our side. Uh, the, the developer had promised to provide open space there, and, and now he wants to put in, uh, a couple towers. So, so that battle uh, continues. But, but Sandy, uh, I, of course, changed everything. Uh, the, uh, it's now in a coastal high hazard zone. The city of Hoboken passed, uh, amended their flood ordinance so that now uh, that, that kind of uh, development is prohibited. Uh, so uh, so it, it really did teach us a lesson about the dangers of building too close to the water's edge and, and that really coincides with what we've been advocating. Do either one of our commentators want to take a shot or respond? Um. Sure. I mean, I think um, maybe it, it might be so obvious to you guys that you don't even feel you have to say it, but it, you know, the, I think what Sandy did was not completely change the question of should there be waterfront development or shouldn't there be, and should the market drive that development or should community values drive it, as it, re it kind of recalibrates. It changes the math a little bit. It puts, I hope, a little more of the the math on your side of the equation, you know, to be able to step up and really claim those public values and hang on to them. And it doesn't, you know, again, it isn't a question of development or not. It's a, it's a little bit who has the leverage in that process. So, so let me throw out a controversial notion, um, having been in government, 
that um, locally based community groups and their need, their need and ability to bring disparate parties together are inherently um, uh, inefficient for rapid government reaction to major, major challenges. Respond. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. Well, I think, I think the way in which government responds may not be rapid enough. And, and in many ways, the, the issue we're having is that they're, I mean, I wish you could take government agencies and actually have them see the other, you know, and have both parties see the side. If you're sitting in a room every day in the in, in Manhattan and you're trying to make decisions about what's being happening on the Rockaways, they have no idea until they've gotten on the train for two hours to get from point A to point B. And if you were to take that and translate that for a 10-year-old, 11-year-old child who's traveling to school every day, and I'm talking about kids that go from one end of the Rockaway Peninsula to the other, not the other, not to the, to the city, right? There's huge issues here that are not being addressed because they're not seeing what the issues are for an average everyday person. They don't see the struggles of a child. They don't see the struggles of those families without jobs. So there has to be a different kind of reaction and I just, I, my hope would be that more government agencies would get involved on the ground to actually really understand on the ground what's going on because that's the advantage all the community groups have is that we see every day what's going on, like the real situation of what's going on. They're not seeing the real reaction and so again, Again, we want them to do something. We want the government to react. These plans, I think, are good because it shows a collective group of people who have all agreed these are the issues, these are the things we want. So it does help to give the government agencies the marching orders. But I think we're, we're able to respond, but in a very different way, because we have more grassroots, ground, uh, on the ground knowledge, right? So trying to get it to the governments, I think, is important. Um, ditto, ditto, ditto. Uh, thank Good you. answer. <laughs> um, but but two things. I, I think number one is is that um, with private funding that we've received, we have rehabilitated, cleaned up, rehabilitated, um, uh, built up more houses in Newark and Ironbound than the government has through uh, its programs thus far. Um, and the second thing is is partnerships again, and where you all work together, things get done more quickly. The Blue Acres program that the state operates and buying back. Uh, damaged houses through uh, at pre-market, uh, pre-Sandy values is working because they come down to our center and do the application process through our center that we do the outreach for because we have connections in the community. Together, it works really well. Partnerships are the key, I think, not one or the other. I'll just be brief. Uh, I, I think the the real importance is just making sure that why it is difficult sometimes to coordinate diverse communities and especially when you're looking at long stretches of, of waterfront, the importance is, is really understanding what the needs of the community are because there, there are you know diverse needs uh, throughout different communities and what's important uh, to one community may not be important to another. So just being able to have that type of communication and the community-based organizations are often much better at being able to organize the diverse groups and being able to uh, bring bring them to the table. So it is a challenge, and uh, you know, I, I think that what I think in some of our waterfront plans, because you know we weren't in the real nexus of where a lot of the damage was, that some of the focus has, in a sense, moved away from some of those waterfront areas. So I think it's a, it's it's also a mix that when there's, um, you know, there's there's focus areas that that uh, you know, why all communities I think deserve access to waterfront areas and and access to uh, you know healthy and safe recreational spaces. Um, you know, tragedies uh, like Sandy also uh, tend to draw that attention away to, you know, key places where damage needs to be done. And then, unfortunately, communities without the resources and without the community connections sometimes aren't able to bring the attention back. So I think that's a, a, an issue that exists in a lot of different communities throughout the city. Take it over here. <laughs> Yeah, I would just echo a lot of the sentiment that's already been said, but one of the things that is a positive is that elected officials actually will come to um, 
community advocates and also other city agencies to find out and get the pulse of what community members want um, more so than before. But it is always a struggle to get your electeds to focus on the needs of your group when there are so many needs throughout our communities besides the waterfront, but the focus actually in our community has been more of an acknowledgement that we are indeed a waterfront community. So that is something positive that's come out of this. Again, any comments down with our group? Uh, you want to go first? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I had my glasses. <laughs> Stop sitting back. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, in, in Hoboken, the, uh, I don't know, we have, we have yet to see how, how quickly uh, our government is going to be uh, able to respond uh, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, Sandy mitigation uh, issue. And uh, I guess a lot of it is riding on, on whether or not they get funded through the rebuild by design thing. I mean, it's kind of, we have all, it seems all of our eggs in one basket. I, I would just say uh, one thing about, uh, um, you know, at least about, um, the group I work with, we we do have uh, the independence to be able to think about this in, in a fresh way. And sometimes when we see uh, what our gov local government is doing, uh, you, you you know we sort of wonder, well, uh, you know, how did they come to that conclusion? And uh, you know, uh, we we've tried to tap on uh, uh, resources that pro provide the best uh, you know professional advice to us. Um, in a way that we haven't always seen our local government do. So, so I think that's a healthy role we have to play. Um, you know, the only thing I would add is it, at some point along the line, the community is going to weigh in on, on, on the proposal from government. So it just becomes a matter of when and what works best. And, you know, from a, from a pure political perspective, when government goes off and in a room and does their planning, and then brings it to the community, often what happens is you end up with a lot of criticism, a lot of antagonism, and it doesn't work out very well. So it, while it may be more inefficient up front to kind of corral everyone together, I think from a smoother planning process over the long term, it seems to work better. And from a political perspective for uh, elected officials in government, it tends to work out more positively. Yeah, I think the, the metaphor is rock, paper, scissors. Everybody knows that game, right? So, you know, the, the paper are the agencies, you know, the, the um, public servants who work away their lives um, as bureaucrats and doing good work. They would rather not be bothered by the rock, the people, because it complicates their job. So paper covers rock, right? Okay. <laughs> Elected officials cut paper, don't they? You know, so and... The community, the Rock, has a direct avenue, you know, to break that scissors to get to that elected official. So I think communities can can exploit that relationship to their advantage, and ultimately, I think, expedite good outcomes from government. Wow, um, that was so good. I'd be tempted to end it here. Um, uh, or, or, or maybe what we should all do is play a collective game of rock, paper, and scissors and see who ended up winning. But so this is your contestant's final answer. So going down for each one of the community organizations very quickly, within the next two years, what would be a major success for your community? What If you look back two years from now or three years from now, what one thing would you most want to see happen, have happen? You know, I'd like to see a protective barrier built with the community be built, and I think that's quite doable. I just think that between the Army Corps, city parks, all the different agencies that are involved, we really got to work together to make that happen. And I think it's even more important than the boardwalk because right now, uh, as Klaus Jacob had said, the Rockaways in 100 years will be nothing more than a, than a sand dune and, and, uh, or, or a sandbar. And I think that's critical because we have to think about how much are we going to be building up, how much protective layer. The Rockaways are the protective barrier for New York City. And we can protect communities with trees and dunes and all of that. And, and at this point, I think, unfortunately, that may be the best we can get out of this. And that's something that is feasible in the next two years. We, we will have a new Newark administration come uh, July 1st. And I would love to see the, um, 
the values of equity and justice, the principles of sustainability and, um, and good planning uh, be elevated to guide um, all of the new initiatives and uh, works that will be done in Newark so that whether it's um, resiliency and um, uh, matters or it's waterfront planning or community development, uh, we're guided by solid principles that consider the people who live there. On the Harlem River waterfront, I think if we could have uh, a uh, portion of our greenway uh, completed, uh, several miles by then, um, and some real uh, access points where community can actually get out onto the water um, and actually have community members out and utilizing that and hopefully being able to cut away at the uh, statistics of uh, Bronx County being the uh, least healthy uh, county in New York State by getting folks out and uh, doing exercise and uh, being being healthy and engaged in their community. So small goals. <laughs> A victory for us would be to have um, sections of the waterfront that are inaccessible or hard to reach to be um, opened up and also to have the spaces that right now have um, future development and or industry on it for a way for them to be better connected uh, so we can have a continuous waterfront. The big dream is to be able to walk from um, Hunters Point South Park on the Newtown Creek to um, the Elm Jack ball fields um, on Bowery Bay. And if obviously that's a big dream, but the smaller dream would just be to have more of the spaces connected. Great. Um, that, uh, Ron, Ron. Oh, that was a joke. <laughs> Jeez. I got well, you. I, I'm going to, I'm going to echo what, what I've been hearing from the other panelists are, are we would like to see uh, Hoboken's waterfront park, uh, complete, continuous, and whole from one end of town to the other. There's a couple key missing links right now. Uh, they're on the central waterfront, which we're working with the city uh, on now. Uh, it's This is not going to be an easy task, uh, you know, because the value land values in Hoboken have shot up. Uh, acquiring some of this land uh, can be very expensive now. Uh, but uh, but it is doable, and uh, that's that's been our goal. We've been at it for a long time, and it would be great if we could see uh, some meaningful progress on that in the next couple of years. With that, um, <laughs> let me let me conclude and somewhat summarize very quickly. Um, the hope and inspiration of community groups, I think, um, was testimony here today, um, and I think the. The resiliency of the organizations is really the characteristics um, that each one of these community leaders shares. And the challenge of rock, paper, scissors, I think, leaves us all with a model going forward. So <laughs> thanks to our wonderful panel. Big hand. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to Chris. Thank you to the respondents. All right, here's a little bit of housekeeping. I want to make a deal. I, I, I know uh, those of us can smell, smell something delicious in the back of the room. That is our lunch. Now we're really allowed to go grab some lunch uh, uh, in uh, one minute. Uh, but first, you have to promise me, once you grab the lunch, we're going to have two speakers that I know you want to hear from. Uh, Councilwoman Debbie Rose, the new uh, chairperson from Santa Island, our new chairperson of the Waterfronts Committee, is going to have some brief remarks. And they'll introduce the president. Can I have your attention up there, too, folks? Shh. Uh, the president of the Economic Development Corporation, who has had a tremendous role in the uh, revitalization of our waterfront, is going to say a few brief remarks. I promise they'll be brief. I promise they'll be important. So again, thank you to these folks. It reminds me, we're going to, uh, in the spirit of uh, Pete Seeger, one of the founders, the late great Pete Seeger, one of the founders of the MWA. We'll hear a couple of words about Pete, I think, a little later in the day, too, as well. These, uh, I applaud these folks for the work they're doing, and I thank them. They'll be rewarded as our heroes of the harbor at the end of the day during the cocktail party, so come and applaud them at that time. So again, thank you very much. Oh, uh, leaving the dock. We're leaving the dock probably more around two-ish uh, to accommodate uh, an elected official that wants to be part of a panel. So we won't be leaving the dock for a little while, but we'll have a nice cruise from about two to five. Again, go get your lunch, come back, and we'll hear from the two speakers at lunch. Thank you.